What is up, fellow thermonuclear AFers? I am Dan Favalli, and I'm excited for two reasons. One, because I get to talk to my very good friend and longtime capable colleague, Brian Taporek from Bleacher Report, Forbes, and Liberty Ballers. He's also the co-host of the NBA podcast, so go check him out. He's on Twitter, at B Taporek. That's at B-T-O-P-O-R-E-K. So I'm always excited to talk to him, but I'm mega excited because this is the first 2022-2023 Team Look Ahead, Hardwood Knox, is putting out. Uh, I always leave them, not to the last minute, but I like just firing them off rapidly where I'm going to maybe put like three pods out in one day just to get them all up by opening night. But this is just, it's landmark. It's the first one. Um, there's going to be a gap in between when we release the first ones because I'm going on vacation, which is why I'm starting a little bit earlier than I normally would. But it's the inaugural Look Ahead. And they're not previews. They're not even primers. They're Look Aheads. So they're just doubly triply quadruply awesome brian thank you so much for coming back the most important question i will ask on this podcast how are you i am doing well thank you for having me thank you for overselling capable i appreciate that good looking out uh, but no i'm excited i didn't realize this was the inaugural look ahead so now i'm even more excited uh we're just going to spend the next hour talking about who tyrese maxi is better than right that's the entire preview yeah, about why isn't Donovan Mitchell on the Sixers? Because Maxi <laughs> for Mitchell, Maxi and salary for Mitchell straight up was more than enough. Maybe Utah would have needed to send a pick back. At, at least three. All of the Go Bear picks going back to Philly. <laughs> uh, yes, it is the inaugural one, and I'm trying to like single out teams because that that like their off seasons feel done, and the Sixers yeah. feel done. Uh, you know, you know, some of the, I, this changes. Like Utah now feels Utah's not done, but like you were like, oh, I can't do the Jazz or the Knicks. Can't do the Lakers. Uh, the Sixers feel done, and we kind of we have to begin there. What were your general just impressions of everything they did this off season? The way they sort of changed the cosmetic and functional makeup of this team. Were there any? Was there anything? Well, I know specifically what you probably liked, but what was it? Was there anything maybe you didn't like? Yeah, I mean, going into the off season, especially in the weeks leading up to free agency, there was like a steady drumbeat of reports saying James Harden was going to pick up his player option and then probably sign a two year deal on top of that. And I wrote about this about a million times in May and June. Uh, but for one last time, the Sixers would not have been able to do what they did this summer had James Harden picked up his player option. They would have been too close to the apron. They would have only had the taxpayer mid-level exception. So could have gotten Daniel House, could have gotten DeAnthony Melton still, could not have gotten P.J. Tucker. Uh, we'll see how that works out. Like if P.J. Tucker, who signed you know a three-year deal on the non-taxpayer mid-level, so it was three years north of $30 million, he's 37 years old, Like maybe that's a move they grow to regret, and maybe they wish the Harden did opt in. But as of now, Harden taking $14 million less than the max gave them the room under the apron to have non-tax MLE biannual, which they used on Tucker and house respectively love the Melton trade too. So I think this was a home run summer for them. Yeah. They have shooting and defense around Joel Embiid and James Harden. It just feels like that's recipe for success. Where do you land though? And I guess this gets in a larger context of James Harden season, but the actual mm. James Harden resigning, where do you land on the whole, like, salary cap circumvention part oh, of it. God. I can't bring myself to care. I, no. I would understand if it's from, well, is this set a precedent where you're now expecting other stars to take pay cuts uh, to facilitate other moves? I just, I will never advocate for that. If it's something James Harden wanted to do, I just really can't bring myself to care. And I also can't, if there's, if there's a handshake deal under the table that they're going to max them out next summer, uh, I can't bring myself to care about that either because this stuff happens on a smaller scale all the time, a la Nick Batum and Reggie Jackson with the Clippers. Right. Or Bobby Portis with the Bucks this past year, too. Like, I mean, probably... as far as I'm concerned, the Bucks did Bobby Portis a favor, but we can. Sure, <laughs> sure. But, and like, I mean, Kyrie taking less than his max a couple of years ago with Brooklyn so they could squeeze in DeAndre Jordan. Again, a move that they, in retrospect, probably regret. I saw but... you like banging the drum about uh, <laughs> yeah. Nuggets tampering for DeAndre Jordan. Look, <laughs> if you're going to tamper to get DeAndre Jordan, that should be your punishment. <laughs> like, I'm that's... just saying it, that news broke it. It's a dot. So if we're really going to start cracking the whip on investigating tampering, like you're really telling me that the Nuggets called DeAndre Jordan's agreed 
three turns with DeAndre Jordan and leaked it to Shams all within the first minute of free agency. Uh, I'm I mean, suspicious. he could have just been surprised his client was offered a contract at all. <laughs> that's that's that is the the common rebuttal I get, and it's a completely fair point. <laughs> like, especially after how he played this past year, they're like, "Are you, are you sure? Did you not watch my client last year?" Okay, yeah, definitely. <laughs> like, uh, I've got the tweet ready. Maybe he had his drafts. So he was going to send it to Shams and Woj right away. Uh, but no, I don't. I mean, I don't think the Sixers are dumb enough to have put it in writing if they did do this. And like James Harden was a max player before this. So if he comes back and he has a max caliber season, I don't think you need to put it in writing. Like I would be surprised if they have already agreed to the number of years that they will give him next summer. But if he has a bounce back year, then yeah, he's going to get max next summer because it doesn't matter for their you know financial flexibility. Like if he would have to take another massive discount for them to have anywhere close to enough space under the apron to have a non-taxpayer again, and they're not going to have the biannual because they used it this summer. So like they're just going to be over the apron. They're going to have the taxpayer MLE, and they're going to give James Harden a massive contract if he bounces back as they're hoping he will. It'll be interesting if they max him out after a bad season, though. That's where things are yeah. I think. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. How concerned are you, though, about this decline of James Harden? All the offseason reports have been good. Yeah. Uh, he's throwing cakes out the window of a boat. So he's, he's cut carb. <laughs> right, I know. He's cutting down on carbs. Yeah. Uh, but he's going into his age 33 p- campaign, was definitely inconsistent with the Sixers last year, including in the playoffs. What? How concerned are are you about this? And is there anything specifically that you're watching for um, or hoping for from him or, or that makes you even believe that he is headed for this bounce back? No, not prime Houston Rockets, James Harden, but that first season in Brooklyn type of year. Yeah. I mean, they don't need him to be 35 points per game, James Harden, like prime Houston Harden, because they have Joel Embiid. Like he's pretty good. Yeah. He never got to play with someone like that in Houston with all due respect to Chris Paul, which is a very different type of player and Clint Capella, very different type of player. So like, I think his primary value to the Sixers is playmaker, you know, get guys open looks, uh, get Embiid open looks close to the basket, uh, you know, dish out to all of the perimeter shooters that they added this off season, plus Maxi and Tobias Harris. Um, and I, you know, if, if, Things I'm going to look out for are what he's added to complement Embiid. So, like, you know, there are questions right after the trade. Like, how will these guys fit with one another? Embiid's not a traditional pick-and-roll big. And as it turns out, like, the answer was fine. They're both just great basketball players. And their their efficiency in the pick-and-roll, I don't have the numbers offhand. But it, it was absurd. It was, it was close to, like, 1.4 points per possession or something like that. Um, so I'm not concerned about that. I do want to see him take more catch and shoot attempts, especially from three. That's just something that he admitted a bunch of times throughout, like after coming over in the trade that like he just didn't have that opportunity very often in Houston and he's still like getting used to it. So now he's had an entire summer to prepare for that. Um, like that is something he's going to need to do to like fully maximize his potential next to Embiid. And also like it, it's antithetical to everything that Daryl Morey believes in. I'd like to see him take a couple more mid-range shots in the season, not even just a game, just in some time this season. Like, does he, you know, does the floater come back? Like, the, I, the step back three, I know it's his signature shot. It's just even when he was in his prime in Houston, I, like, I felt like that you're bailing the defense out if you are dribbling for 20 seconds and then launching that with, you know, two seconds left and a hand in your face, like the Sixers have enough talent on this roster that that should be, you know, a last resort. If it, if they swing it back to him with five seconds left, cool, do that. But like, there should never be a possession where it's just James Harden dribbling for 20 seconds and launching a step back three. And it's also going to a floater or maybe a mid range jumper. There's like, a stamina element involved where you don't have to worry about as much contact there or just going all the way to the rim, maybe needing as much burst to mm-hmm. do it. And does that just sort of help him navigate the, the rigors of getting older or whatever? Yeah. 
I'm just, I don't want to say I'm unconcerned because he is getting up there in age, but just like he's now had a healthy off season. He also took a pay cut, which to me that he yeah. didn't have to do, but it sort of is just this feels like he's reached this implicit understanding. Well, this is all on me now because I've now forced my way off two teams. One of which I really wanted to be on. Like I forced yeah. my way to Brooklyn. Now I forced my way to Philly and it maybe just something clicked this off season. Uh, and they were also just like, whatever version of James Harden we saw last year probably could be slightly more efficient, especially if he's taking different types of shots. That's still a top end all-star. I think because of the passing, just what he does and the way defenses react to him and how he creates for everyone else. So I'm not unconcerned. Like you do need James Harden to be at like close to all NBA level. I think if you want to be peak Sixers uh, and be a threat to the Celtics, to the Bucks. To, to the Warriors out West and, and all those powerhouses. But I, I just, I can't buy into this because if this is a decline, it's a very just stark and abrupt decline. There was like no warning mm-hmm. and it all of a sudden just happened. And so that's almost why I don't necessarily buy into the idea of James Harden on this mega decline, even if he's entering a different phase of his career. Yeah. And like we saw this with Chris Paul a couple of years ago where he had the hamstring injury that lingered and it was around this same age. And we're like, oh, is Chris Paul just washed? And then he goes to OKC and is fine, goes to Phoenix and, you know, gets them within two wins of a championship. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's muscle watch season. So I don't want to read too much into it. But like, you know, there all of the reports were last season Harden came into camp woefully out of shape. Uh, unless he just goes on like a three week eating bender right now. I mean, everything, (laughs) you know, he looks good right now. So I don't think they're going to have to worry about that aspect of it. At least you sort of already touched upon this or alluded to it. At least what did you make of the Embiid Harden partnership last year? Was there anything that surprised you in a good way? Something that you might still be a little bit concerned about moving forward. I thought it was just a lot more organic then I was high on it, but it just felt Mm -hmm. like it didn't really feel inorganic or forced or like there was this huge learning curve between the two that was needed. Yeah. I mean, I remember after the first game (laughs) and Pete gives us, I think it was on TV. He gives like this post game quote where he's like, these these are the easiest shots I've ever had. (laughs) It was just like, you just had to subtweet Ben Simmons, of course, when you say this, but yeah, I mean, they worked pretty well in concert with one another. I would think with more time, you know, a full training camp. And then like, I had, I would assume they worked out together at some point this off season. Um, And they've now just having with one another now know how to tailor their game. So they know what to work on, even in their own individual skill development. So I think, there's no reason to expect it to take a step back in year two. I don't know if they're going to have like, you know, 1.6 points per one possession in a pick and roll. Like, I, you know, the, the early returns were already promising enough in that department. Uh, but I think all of the concerns about their potential fit, because like be the fate, you know, back to the basket guy, which isn't even true anymore. Uh, or is it like just not a traditional pick and roll guy? So, well, it's because he didn't have a point guard to run pick and roll with. Like now, he has one of the best passers of his generation. And now the, the personnel they've added this off season is only going to further complement that. This is, was a question that, well, it wasn't really a question, but it's one I've had who is more likely to be an MVP candidate among the two James Harden or Joel Embiid. You know, uh, I've had that same question too. And honestly, like Embiid is, um favored right now you know on all the drafting FanDuel wherever you want to look he I think he's um tied for I'm looking at FanDuel right now Luke is the favorite he's tied with Giannis for second but like I just can't shake the idea that Harden might be the better bet between the two maybe just in terms of like their respective odds you know Embiid's a plus 700 Harden is a plus 10,000. So like at those odds, I would take Harden over Embiid. Like I just, I don't know how much, what else Embiid can do beyond what he did last year. I think the availability concerns will always be there. Uh, and I think if Harden has this bounce back year, like there, there, he's coming from a lower floor than Embiid where like 
You just led the league in scoring. You're, you know, the most dominant big man since Shaq. And you also have to contend with who is plays the same position, is going to, you know, shatter all advanced metrics because of the style he plays. Uh, so, you know, and B, I think he deserves to have higher odds than Harden going into the season. But, like, I'm going to write a best bets thing for Forbes at some point this month, and I'm going to mention Harden for MVP. And there's, I also tend to gravitate. I agree with you. And it was a thought that I feel like not a lot of people shared, which is why I asked. Uh, James Harden's odds feel like ones that sports books will try to buy back in the middle yeah. of the season from you and let you cash out. Because I just feel like, yes, Joel B could be the best, most valuable player on this team and the Sixers be a contender. But if James Harden's really going to have all this agency over the offense, uh, if you're not, you know, if you're, if you are the best version of yourself, is it because he sort of just, um, you know, balled out? And so it just feels yeah. like will will Embiid also be hurt by having Harden? Will we see his shots streamlined a little bit? We did. We saw that during after the trade. And so it's not, you know, they might cannibalize the votes for each other. And I think that happens when you have two megastars. Um, and yeah. so that's the, the danger there. I just think I would bet Harden before I would Embiid at this point, especially for all the reasons that you laid out. So James Harden, Joel Embiid out of the way. Now we have to talk about the most fascinating player on the, the Sixers roster, clearly. Year three, Tyrese Maxey. What is, can we reasonably expect him to make another leap? He was so good last year before the James Harden trade. And then his role gets streamlined. And he's just like, absolutely, like the same level of lethal just thrived in, I don't even know how to describe it. It's streamlined because it wasn't an easier role. It wasn't a smaller role, but just off these threes that were being generated for him from Harden. Um, and then just the catch and go decisions that he was making. So is there, we know he's going to be, he's a great fit for this team. Is there a way for him to level up within it though? Or does playing alongside Embiid and Harden sort of artificially repress his ceiling? Or is it the fact that he might be coached by Doc Rivers and not get enough time? <laughs> running his own unit? Sure. I mean, that's, that is a concern. Uh, no, I think, Everyone around the team, like the team itself. And then like, you know, when you talk to the coaching staff in the front office, like everyone just raves about Tyrese Maxey. Like they, it, it, I swear he is the favorite son among all, all Sixers players. Um, so I think because he has this just ridiculous work ethic, I'm not betting against another leap. We've seen, Again, it's like off season. I don't know how much you want to read into like workout footage, but yeah, everyone has gained 10 pounds of muscle while losing right. 10% body fat or getting below 10% body fat, whatever. Right. I mean, he does look like he put on some muscle, so we'll see there. But I think especially after Harden came over, he really started to try to add that step back three to his bag. And it wouldn't shock me if he is a better step back three point shooter than James Harden this coming season. And so I think that's going to be, can he be a off the dribble three level scorer? Because if he can, that's going to give them, you know, three options that might push a defense past its breaking point. Like you can't double Embiid and Harden and then also have Maxi to worry about. So I like, I don't know. It's just so hard to rationally evaluate him because he took such a big <laughs> leap from year one to year two. And, you know, like he came up briefly in Kevin Durant discussions this off season when the Sixers like, you know, were mentioned for three days. Uh, and there, like, there are people in Philly that wouldn't trade Tyrese Max. Uh, this happens with every fan base and clearly it happened with a lot of teams this off season with Scotty Barnes and Brandon Ingram, but like that, that's how high people in Philly uh, feel about Maxi as well. I ranked him leading into the off season in terms of trade assets, players that I thought could be available where I thought to frame it, I thought the Sixers were way more likely to put Tyrese Maxi on the table in a trade than I thought the Raptors were with Scotty Barnes or the Cavs with Mobley. So like they didn't factor mm -hmm. into that discussion i had tyrese maxi ranked as the single most valuable trade asset in the nba you might have been the wow. one that hit that article 
because that jump he made and like, yeah, if you don't buy into the three level finishing from last year where he went from 31% on threes to 44 and he goes from like sub 59% at the rim to 63. Mm-hmm. I bought into it after watching yeah. it. And like the hardest part of his role is now behind him. Unless James Harden is just absolutely sucks or someone gets injured <laughs> on right. this team because you were the number two guy before he got there. So I'm all in on Tyrese Maxey. Uh, and I'm just hoping we get to see, and we have to, because we saw it even after the trade. I think where he could maybe make the biggest leap is one, maybe you're just reinforcing everything you did last year, but is what do those lineups, can he actually be the one that buys you time if you want to rest Joel Embiid and James Harden together? How much time mm-hmm. can he buy you in those stretches? And then he should certainly be on the court a bunch when James Harden is off it. He is just like, when we're talking about a three level score and someone who I think like improved a lot as a passer, when you're looking at the the scale of his decision-making, there's sometimes a little bit harder to fit in where they have to be like lead this heliocentric existence. And he just very much does not have to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated to see what he looks like. Cause you know, coming in to the NBA, he didn't shoot well during his lone year at Kentucky doesn't play a ton as a rookie, but didn't shoot well and shot on relatively low volume from three uh, in that first season. Last year, he shoots 42.7 from three on you know only 4.1 attempts per game. So not like when I'm talking stuff, but like the entire year, I'm just waiting for the regression to hit and it never did. And now there, the question is like, was that just an outlier season or is he just really that good of a shooter? And we got blinded by, you know, a year or two of bad shooting in college. And then this first year in his pros. So I think it's probably like, I lean more toward he is a good shooter. um, And that's what the Sixers were betting on when they drafted him. I remember Maury during his, like right after the draft was saying like, you go back and look at high school uh, you know, we believe in his mechanics. But we just think it was one bad year. And again, like this is where his ridiculous work ethic comes into play. Like I, I have faith in him really adding to his game every off season in particular. So I, I am ready for Tyrese Maxey. You know, the one bummer is that, you know, especially in the wake of this uh, Donovan Mitchell trade, I was thinking like, the East is just so loaded at guard that it wouldn't shock me if he plays at an all-star caliber level, but I just don't think there's a window for him to actually make the all-star team. Um, But with that said, like I wouldn't be shocked if we're having him in the conversation as some of the best young guards in the league, like right with, you know, a Cade Cunningham or a LaMelo ball or a Tyrese Halliburton. I think he is probably like his ceiling is just, I think it's, and looking at like some of the the effort he puts in specifically defensively too on the ball, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I just feel like he's someone as of right now, his ceiling, I'm not saying at this moment, his best case outcome is better than Donovan Mitchell is right now. It's better than, you know, maybe even Shea Gilders Alexander. I know there's the size difference when you're looking at Shea versus Maxi, and I'm not saying he'll be better than him right away, but it's not unrealistic to think, well, I believe Tyrese Maxi in three years or whatever is going to be better than Donovan Mitchell is right now. And that's not some, that's not me shitting on Donovan Mitchell. Who's a fantastic player. That's sure. how high I am on Maxi. And I will say, do you know what he, I bet you do what he shot from three after the James Harden trade. It was a buy it, right? It was what? Above 45%. 46.2% on 5.1 that attempts is, per game. That doesn't happen that on is. accident. I'm sorry. <laughs> You just endeared yourself to all of Philadelphia, by the way, by putting him above Donovan Mitchell in particular. Thank you for that. I mean, it's like a, yes, Donovan Mitchell right now, I'm still inclined to go with when you look at his sure, sure. scoring, but I don't, I, we don't talk. We're talking about Scotty Barnes in terms of a future superstar and Evan Mobley and Cade Cunningham. And rightfully so, I don't actually think he ends up being better than any of those guys, but is it just because Embiid and Harden are here that we're afraid to talk about like Maxi is no, I don't think he's worth Kevin Durant on his own. And if you're giving yeah. up a trade offer for a current superstar, the Sixers don't have the other assets to attach to him. But like, this is a blue chip cornerstone prospect. And yeah. based off what we saw last season. And so unless he's just going to completely implode this year, I just don't know why we're not nationally talking 
about him in that vein more. Yeah, I think it's the draft pedigree. And then like the the question of, is this an outlier year? But if he has another year like he did last year, I think he will force his way into those conversations. And yeah, I mean, it speaks to, I just wrote a piece at Liberty Ballers today about like, you know, the Sixers are not going to have much flexibility really for the rest of the decade. Uh, you know, <laughs> they, you know, they owe three first round picks to Brooklyn or OKC already. Um, they're, you know, they're going to be, if they re-sign Harden, and then depending on what happens with Maxi, like he's probably going to get max or near max contracts. So like they're going to be Maxi. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Uh, so they're going to be in tax territory for the foreseeable future. Uh, so like they really need to hit on the few assets they do have. But you know, you see, you, you get him at twenty one, or like the Pelicans with Herb Jones at thirty five last year. Like you hit on one of these late first round, early second round picks. And it really does change the trajectory of your franchise. This is going to sound like a troll, but it's not meant to be. Oh boy. Do you buy into more Paul Reed this year? Is the backup five spot just going to be him? And then we'll see PJ Tucker at the five as well. And I know that Reed is, he's six, nine Tucker's like six, six or Mm -hmm. whatever. And if you buy into him actually having an expanded role, um, what are you looking to see from him most this year, aside from that uptick in minutes, like being in foul trouble, less more consistent as a finisher out of the pick and roll. Um, just, just what are you kind of looking for from him this year? Because he does feel like sort of a sneaky, important player on this team right now. Maybe yeah. Not even I mean, sneaky. He currently profiles as the primary backup center. It's going to be between him and Charles Bassey. They'll battle it out in training camp. Um, I, got in trouble with Sixers Twitter the other day because I floated the idea of signing Hassan Whiteside as a backup center. Uh, And, you know, some of the takes that I got in return have me convinced that a lot of people stopped watching Hassan Whiteside in 2018 because he's like, he's good as a backup center in a 15, 20 minute per game role. He was genuinely good in Utah last year. And I think he could be helpful uh, in Philly. I don't, I don't think they're going to do it. It seems like Maury especially learned his lesson last season with DeAndre Jordan, where like if you give Doc Rivers a vet, he is going to play the vet uh, to the detriment of the team. Like it was very clear that Paul Reed was a better option than DeAndre Jordan, and Doc didn't play him until like the final few games of the regular season. Lo and behold, Paul Reed's playing as the main backup setter uh, throughout most of the playoffs. So. Yeah, I think I, like I'm I'm nervous. I'm excited to see w- what he looks like, especially with Harden, because um, I think you know with his passing ability, he is able to lift guys who aren't able to create their shot on their own, especially big men. Like we saw it with Capella in Houston, in particular. Um, with that said, you know I do slightly worry that like the Sixers are so in win now mode and then this backup center spot which is pretty critically important for them given Joel Embiid like you're not going to get 82 games out of Joel Embiid you're probably not even to get 70 games out of Joel Embiid and even if you could don't (laughs) right right so like they're so in win now mode but then they have you're gonna get like 15 games most likely where you're relying on Reed, Bassey, Tucker as your main centers. Um, so I think it is it is one of the biggest questions, if not the single biggest question about this team going into the year, at least in terms of roster construction. Obviously, like Harden's health is the biggest question, but like, you know, in terms of unfinished business going into training camp, uh, what they do at backup center, I think, is the thing to monitor. Although I do think... I would be surprised if they make a move because right now they're one over the roster limit. They've got 16 guys under contract. So they already have to figure out what to do there. So to to the sign white side, they'd have to waive two guys instead of one. And I know Maury's there and he played a lot of five in Houston, but do you expect Tucker to log ample time like in the backup five spot this year? I think in the playoffs, like if they don't sign a white side or whoever uh, in the playoffs, that's probably it's Reed and then Tucker as the main options, depending on who you're facing. I would, 
like you can dabble in it during the regular season just so you can especially get used to those minutes. So it's not like you're throwing that out for the first time in the playoffs. But again, PJ Tucker's 37. Like you got to be mindful of limiting the wear and tear on his body as well. So I wouldn't want, especially against like a bigger post up backup center, I wouldn't really want to do that. Like maybe, you know, against the Bucks and Bobby Portis. Cool. Sure. Yeah. Go for it. But uh, uh, like a Robin Lopez, I would just be like, all right, Paul Reed, just go foul him a bunch of times. Sir Charles Bassey, you got six fouls. Just go, go eat those up for 15 minutes. The so Matisse Thibel, where does he factor into all this now? I'm officially on board with him being one of the most under or overrated players in the NBA. Excuse me. I feel like he's more limited offensively at this point than Andre Robertson was, uh, for the Thunder. Uh, am I wrong there? But like, where does or do you still view him as like you don't have to say a core piece of this team, but they need Matisse Thibel to be in, in their rotation or no, because now you have Tucker and House and even Melton that he's just so much less essential insofar as he was ever essential. Yeah. I think that's a good way to phrase it. Um, my question would be like, do we know how many vaccine shots he's gotten since the end of the season? Cause that, that played a role in the Toronto series. Uh, and I believe you still yeah, it helped. It still... helped out the Sixers. <laughs> <It hurt Brad. laughs> right. right. I believe he's still not eligible to travel to Toronto as of current guidelines. So hopefully they don't meet again. Um, No, I think the additions will definitely give him more competition for minutes. I do think he still factors in. Like, I think the pendulum has swung a little bit too far against him. I think a lot of it stems from the vaccine stuff. And then also like he is so offensively limited that he is a huge liability in the playoffs for that reason. We'll see how, what, if anything, he added to his game this offseason. I know a video was circul- circulating the other day of him like doing some ridiculous dribbling drill, which you know was funny because like people were like, "Oh yeah, that's definitely what you need to work on." You know, but it was not not anywhere realistic uh, in terms of what what dribbling during an NBA game would look like. But he does need to work on creating off the dribble. He can't do it can't do it at all and he can't shoot threes and because of that he is a huge liability so if he adds those facets to his game and you know he can scale down defensively a little bit now because of the addition of tucker in particular where i think he's miscast as this primary wing stopper i think he's much better in an off ball help role but pair him with d'anthony melton in the second unit where both of those guys have been among the league leaders in deflections and steals over the last couple seasons. And like, they could really mess some stuff up for some opposing backcourt. So I I think there is room for him to play. And I think the regular season is the time to experiment. And like, let's see, can he add this to his game? Can he become, he's not going to be like, you're not taking a Tyrese Maxey leap where you go from 30% to 43 from three in one season. But like, you know, can he knock down even close to 35% as long as he's at least somewhat of a threat to hit those shots and you have to occasionally guard him that will at least make him playable in the playoffs. Do you know how many shots he took after using three or more dribbles last year? <laughs> Zero. Uh, 20, 22. I would have guessed. Uh, it was higher than I thought. I looked it up while you were talking. Uh, my next question here is, and you told me that you were not expecting this question, but I'm asking it anyway. Yes. The Sixers were 28th in average possession time after the James Harden trade and then 26th in transition frequency, which just like there's kind of the element of duh, but do you see a way for them to focus on speeding it up or even a need for them to be more opportunistic in transition? And I'm probably mostly thinking about you know, they have B-Ball Paul, they have Melton, they have Maxi. So maybe it's some of their ancillary lineups where you're focusing on trying to get up and down the court quicker just to give their offense like a different layer to it. Yeah, I'd love to see that. Um, I think a lot of this stuff last off season was integrating Harden on the fly. So they didn't really have a chance to like learn plays. And, you know, maybe that's uh, a detriment to doc rivers or not not a credit to him 
Uh, but, you know, they, it's just like you don't really get to practice a lot during the season. There's just not enough time to do it. Um, so I think, again, having a full training camp and preseason, maybe that alone will help them get a little bit closer to league average in that department. But, yeah, I mean, they've especially with they got three guys that you mentioned, they've got the young guys and even Thibel's pretty athletic. Like I, I would like point. to see those bench units just give a different look. I think that's really we've seen it throughout the playoffs. Like if, if you have one thing where you're, if you're like a one trick pony and the opposing team figures out that trick, you're cooked. But if you have different lineups or different looks that you can throw out on a possession by possession basis or an opponent by opponent basis, then all of a sudden, like that's the key to going on these deeper runs. When you look at this roster, What's their single biggest weakness right now, whether it's a player archetype, specific position, or just, just functional void? Yeah, I mean, I think backup center is one major area of concern. We'll see how Reed and Bassey look early in the season and how much they lean on the Tucker stuff. Like, my my worry is that Doc has a quick hook with the young guys because they're young and mistake-prone and foul a lot leans on Embiid too much or leans on the Tucker at the five lineups too much, both of which you should really limit as much as you can during the regular season to keep those guys fresh for the playoffs. I think the other is, you know, you just look at the rest of the top teams in the East. Um, maybe, you know, Tucker and Embiid combined can slow down Giannis a little bit, but it does feel like they're one wing stopper short or one three and D wing short especially if they go against boston and you know the tatum brown duo like you look at their starting five tucker will be on one of them presumably i guess tobias is going to be on the other one and i just don't like how those matchups play out for them have you thought about any trade targets or i guess free agency if you'd like to go that route you'd like to see them go after you address any of this or are they just they're hard capped and you just feel like they're probably going to be more inactive than not this this season on the transaction market? I just yeah, that sounds so weird. I know you're hard capped, but it's a Daryl <laughs> Morey team. Right, right, right. I know. I wrote about uh, at Liberty Ballers the other day, um, you know, some of the obstacles, basically like their lack of salary matching chips. It's Korkmaz at five million, Thibel at four point four and then like a bunch of guys. You know, Shake Milton's 2 million, Jaden Springer's a little over two, like Isaiah Joe's 1.8. But you have to basically like cobble together a three for one for anyone making, you know, north of like 13, 14 million dollars. So Jordan Clarkson has been a popular name thrown out on Sixers Twitter lately. But Kyle Newbeck of Philly Voice just uh, rebutted that today. I said they're, they're not really interested because they, you know, they, they are planning to basically stagger Maxine Arden. They think they're pretty set in terms of ball handling and Clarkson doesn't really fill the archetype that they need. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted Patrick Beverly before he signs or he oh, got really? traded. Yeah. Where he got traded to the Lakers. Oh, I just wanted to really go all in on the Rockets East thing. Okay. Um, <laughs> but no, I think at this point, I'm more curious to see what Thibel looks like. And then, cause like the Cork Moss Thibel thing, that's it. Like that is the last chip in their bag that they can cash in this season. And after that, if really like that, there is no other way to significantly improve. So Bible has gotten a lot better this off season. I'd want to see that first before trading him. Um, and I think we get a little bit of the trade deadline. You can see how Bible looks like Cork has had a pretty bad season last year. If he bounces back, can he be, a swing rotation player at times. And then if not, if you're totally out on both of those guys, then let's reevaluate close to the deadline when it's clear which guys may or may not be on the move. Yeah, that feels like definitely wait and see for them. I, you obviously wouldn't expect moves anytime soon. Uh, I had thought about like, if I was to get someone from the Jazz and I were them, I'd want Malik Beasley. I just doubt whether they yeah. have the, the equity to get him. Uh, I also thought about you probably wouldn't have the equity to get like a Kyle Kuzma from Washington. Yeah. Uh, would you be opposed to a Josh Richardson reunion? 
I wouldn't love it. <laughs> I thought about it. Uh, I was not wild about it. Let me see if I could pull up my list because I like went through. I, I thought this is a stab in the dark, but it's they didn't trade for Donovan Mitchell. They have Quentin Grimes and R.J. Barrett. Cam Reddish apparently doesn't want to be there or wants more playing sure. time. He's not going to be there. Do you take a stab in the dark on on Cam Cam Reddish to try and just sort of deepen what is like? It's a ring wing rotation where. It's not particularly certain. I know Daniel House fell off a cliff for a while, has a good year with Utah last season, but like you're dependent, super dependent on Daniel House and Furkan Korkmaz and Matisse Thibel. That's not the cushiest position to be in when you're looking at true wings. Yeah. So the the dream targets that I came up with were like Jay Crowder, Reggie Bullock, Robert Covington. Although I can't imagine the Korkmaz Thibel package gets any of those guys. I can't imagine, frankly, any of those teams are really looking to trade any of them because they are all or at least like the Suns and the Clippers uh, are very much all in right now and, you know, are probably among the title favorites in the West. Mm-hmm. Um, I had Terrence Ross and Gary Harris prior to the injury. So strike him from the record there. Um, Cause Ross, you can at least uh, you can just do for Cork Maz and Thibel alone. And they're still under the apron. Um, Kelly Oubre Jr., Alec Burks, Nerlens Noel. Like, there just aren't a ton of a ton of guys that would move the needle for them anyway. Um, so for that reason, and especially with, like, the, the salary matching plus apron concerns make it really difficult to a- assemble a trade that makes them meaningfully better. So for that reason, I think up to the season, they're probably going to be a little quiet, and then we'll see once ha- once we see how all of these new guys fit maybe they reevaluate that close to the deadline if you had to pick one player that's most likely to be traded by the deadline on this team who is it i think a lot of people want it to be tobias harris quietly was just fo- like rock solid to finish the year anyway yeah. last season but moving a salary that large in the middle of the season i would just be yeah. i would love to know the details of that trade so i just personally wouldn't pick him i yeah i think it's thibel uh because he's heading into the last year of his deal. So if you don't envision him as a part of the future and you just don't want to deal with his restricted free agency, um, and again, he is like, you have to package Quirk Maz and Thibel to get any meaningful salary back. Uh, so I think it's going to be those two guys combined with one another would be the most likely to be moved. What is the 10 man rotation? look like for this team it feels like the top eight are pretty set when you have maxi Harden, and harris tucker and Embiid. there's your starting five and then there's deanthe melton daniel house and i i have paul reed penciled in there uh yeah. do you agree with those eight and then like how are you rounding out if you're picking a 10 man rotation for this team the the final two yeah i definitely agree with those eight i don't think you're bringing in tucker house and melton if you don't even envision them as rotation players or that would be a, a very strange way to build the team if you're Daryl Morey. Uh, I think Niang played well in the regular season last year, fell off in the playoffs. He was dealing with a knee injury, so I don't know how much that contributed to it, but he's also going to be pushed down. Like he was, you know, realistically like their sixth or seventh best player after the Harden trade. So now they've rounded out their depth again. He's going to be back into that like ninth man eighth or ninth man role that i think is a little better suited for him i think thibel gets first crack at that 10th spot but okay. if he struggles wouldn't shock me to see that end up being a, a rotation between furcon and shake as well um like i you know at different points throughout the year guys are going to get hurt guys are going to get rested so i think all of them are going to play um but yeah i would think Thibel is just going in such a critical year that I think you have to figure out what you have in him and if you want to commit to him moving forward. I'd probably agree. I considered like, should it just be Furcon and Thibel and like, you're going to just count on being a little bit undersized. But um, if he's healthy and Yang makes a lot of sense is just like sliding into the four spot, especially when you look at some of the, like if, if Paul Reed or PJ Tucker are going to be your primary backup fives, he makes a lot of sense to be part of the rotation then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, who is the the player on this team that's most likely to have a bigger role than expected, though? I think it's DeAnthony Melton. I okay. feel like wow. that 
that addition has just kind of flown under the radar because there's been a ton of other stuff that happened this off season and rightfully so. Uh, but I think he's going to have a, a sneaky big role as, I mean, he's one of the better two way players on the roster. And I think the defense is going to be very critical um, next to either Maxi or Harden or both, which we can get to shortly. Um, you know, a, a did not shoot well from three for his first two years, but over the past two, 38.8 from deep as well. So Playoffs, I think he's a little bit rough for him, though. Is yeah, like the red flag there. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think he's going to like start or anything. I mean, I think their their starting five is pretty locked in. Um, but it would not shock me if Melton is like more impactful than expected. Honestly, same goes for Daniel House. Like I, I, you know, he, after the bubble situation, felt like he just kind of became an afterthought in the league, but like didn't play a ton or didn't play a ton of games in Utah last year, but looked really good when he did Mm. play. So I, I liked both of those additions. I think both of those guys will play uh, sizable roles. We are in the cookie cutter portion of this podcast. If people have not, uh, couldn't tell already where these are the questions that I ask about every team. I know this question too specifically can be matchup dependent. What is Philly's most used or best closing lineup going to be? Is it just the the starting five? Almost, I think if you look at it, probably regardless of matchup, unless you really want to just downsize on the wings and play Tucker and Bead with like three smalls in Harden, Melton, and Maxi or something. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I think it's going to be the Maxi, Harden, Harris, Tucker, and Bead because like. You're not going to, I mean, you know, the, the typical answer is just remove your five and play Tucker at the five, but you're not taking Embiid out of any lineup, any optimal lineup, much less a crunch time one. And you mentioned Harris, like he played really, it took him a while. It took him longer than Embiid and Maxi to acclimate to the new Harden reality. But by the end of the year, he really bought in into playing well, like the, you know, he, he, Doc has been hammering this point ever since he got there, but like just making Tobias into a quick decision player, uh, like the more he dribbles and thinks, the worse he is. And he really just started catching and shooting like without hesitation by the end of the year, bought in on defense as well in the playoffs, like was arguably their second or third best player in the playoffs. Uh, cause uh, you know, Harden was so inconsistent and Embiid was in the lineup with injuries. So, yeah, I think um, the, the starting five, uh, you know, barring just I, I can't even imagine what scenario would be where you're pulling one of those five guys out. The offensive firepower in their top four, uh, unless you consider P.J. Tucker their fourth best player, just like Harris, Harden, Embiid, and Maxi is that is thermonuclear as fuck, as we say around the <laughs> Yeah, like Tobias is overpaid, but I also don't know how many teams have a better number four option than Tobias Harris. Yeah, that's a that's a yeah. If Tobias Harris is your number four option, you're you're in pretty damn good shape. Uh, is there a quirky, unconventional, weirdo lineup that you want to see from this team? Yeah, I want to see a three guard lineup with Tucker at the five. We're never going to see it because Doc Rivers is the coach. But I'd love to see Maxi Harden, Melton one of house and Harris and Tucker. That would be mine as well too. And you really just don't think there's no chance. Even when you're looking at the backup center rotation, I would love to be wrong, but I don't know. I mean, (laughs) nothing about doc's rotation management suggests that he's going to quirky and fun and, and weirdo are not weirdo in a, a different way, but not in a, in a fun, like Nick nurse, let's just try out some creative stuff. So I don't know. Hopefully there's more synergy between Maury and doc and like these signings send a message or these moves send a message like, Hey, let's get with the program. Like let's try these three guard lineups because we've seen them work for other teams really, really well. And Melton has the skill set on both ends of the floor where he would work well with these two guys. Let's, Let's try it and see what happens. Like that's the point of the regular season to figure out stuff that we could, you know, pull out, uh, out of desperation in the playoffs if we need to. So like if we lose six minutes in the regular season, 
because we're trying this. Who gives a damn? <laughs> uh, I think the one I would want to see is I would be curious with it's Tucker at the five because I think that's you know I don't want to see him beat off the court, but if you want to get a little weird with this team, it's Tucker at the five, and I'd kind of like to see um, Maxi Melton Harden and or House Harden Thibel and Maxi with Tucker, where it's that lineup is very small, mm. but I'm wondering if it's okay defensively when you're looking at the names that are around yeah. Harden at that point. Yeah, I mean, I really, I just want to see Melton and Thibel together as much as possible because I, I, especially if they're going against backups, like that just feels like they are going to generate so many turnovers. So, and, they, and then, yeah, pairing Reed with those guys too, maybe like, you know, and, and Harden with the, if those guys are generating turnovers, you have Harden's passing, you have Reed just ready to bounce out of the gym. Like it, there are a lot of fun lineups they could try but I'm just not sure how many we're going to see. Uh, yeah, that's fair. So as we record this, their over under is set at 50.5. Would you yeah. take the over or the under on that? And where do you see them stacking up in the Eastern conference? Yeah, this is going to be another one in my Forbes Sixers best bets. Cause their, their over under last year was also 50.5 and heading into last year. Yeah. Ben Simmons holding out of training camp. Didn't have Ben Simmons for the first half of the year. Trade half of their rotation for James Harden midway through. Still finished with 51 wins. So, like, I guess it, this is a hedge against a long-term Embiid injury. Like, that's the only explanation I could really see for them being under 50.5. Because mm-hmm. now you get a full season of Harden. You have significantly upgraded the supporting cast around these guys. So like an Embiid injury plus them not signing, you know, plus Reed struggling as a full-time center or Bassey not being able to fill in and or Tucker, whatever. Like, I, I think they have the personnel to, I'm not saying they're going to win like 65, but I, you know, it feels like low to mid fifties feels relatively safe to me. I think I would go with the over two. Are you interested in knowing how you did last year on their prediction, because I have that lot. So there the Sixers over under when we did it was at uh, 51.5. Okay. Oh, even higher. Okay. Uh, Oh, okay. And which was, I I was surprised looking back, knowing we knew the Ben Simmons shit was happening. We both went under. So we were correct. Yes. By half a win. (laughs) I'll take it. Where do you see them sort of stacking up in the East, though? And like, I, they're 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 a top six team. It would something yeah. catastrophic has happened for not. I'm trying to think of the teams that I'd be willing to say I think are definitely better than them. And I've grappled with I don't know what I'm going to do with the Cavs because I'm so high on them now. But I've grappled with putting yeah. them into my tier one contenders with Boston and Milwaukee. I still think just we need to see what's going on with James Harden, the backup five rotation, yeah. the wing rotation worries me a little bit. So I'd still have them in tier two, but I think Boston and Milwaukee to me are the only teams that I look at and I would be comfortable quasi guaranteeing they have a better regular season record than the Sixers in the East. Yeah, I completely agree. I think they're, they should be third. Um, wouldn't shock me if they finished with a better record than one of those two teams. If, you know, What's more likely they finish with a better record than Boston or Milwaukee? Oh, probably Milwaukee, right? Because I, I think Milwaukee at this point, they know what they are. Middleton's already hurt and he might not be ready for the start of the year. Like Lopez is older. Drew is also old. Like Boston, other than Horford, has youth on their side relative to Milwaukee. Um I mean, yeah, I I think the Sixers, like personnel wise, are the third best team. And if you don't want to put them in the tier with Boston and Milwaukee, I get it, given like how many more questions they have than those two. But I do think they are I don't know, should they be like a tier one point five? Like I think they they deserve to be on a tier slightly higher than Atlanta. Cleveland, even despite yeah. this trade, Toronto, I don't know. I'm like, Miami. 
I'm drunk on Cleveland right now, but we're recording this just a couple of days after that. Trip. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I know. That, but talk about a wing rotation you're concerned about. That's also very fair. Isaac Okoro breakout season coming <laughs> right. right now. It, it but, needs to. Or like uh, I, Dylan the Whitler, Sixers, Dean Wade. The, yeah, the Sixers' highest end outcome, though, is tier one contender in the league with Boston, Milwaukee. Yeah. I think you throw Golden State in there. I probably have Phoenix in just tier two at this point where it's like you're kind of running back the same thing without improving who's going to be your third best shot creator. Um, so like those three teams, like Philly, Boston, Milwaukee, Golden State, who else? I'm leaving out. Oh, the Clippers, Clippers and the Nuggets. Yeah. Those are probably my tier one contenders. And I'm I'm like, the Sixers are in there, like I'm naming them. I still don't know if I'm putting them in with like those five other teams, but they they could be right there. It's just what is, I tend to be more optimistic on James Harden, but I think, and Bede's health is always sort of that looming caveat, but I kind of right. am so confident in Tyrese Maxey that my actual biggest question, which doesn't even feel like a big question, is to me, what is James Harden this year? And so maybe the actual biggest question is just like, is this team, they, they make sense around Joel Embiid and James Harden. And there's like some depth there, but is the wing rotation like actually deep enough with two-way players uh, to where like mm -hmm. you don't need to lean too much on Thibel or he improves a bunch. Um, Daniel House doesn't regress on offense uh, what he was doing last year in Utah. So there there are just some question marks there. But this team is just I saw some people who are down on their offseason. We're just like, oh, they gave PJ Tucker three years. Like some team was going to give PJ Tucker three years. So it just right. doesn't matter. They tampered to do it. Whatever. That's fine. I don't care. Uh, <laughs> I thought they had a really good offseason and that they're to, they're probably one of the seven best teams in the league to make. And I, I feel like pretty confident about that. Yeah. Like I think their high end outcome is absolutely championship contender. And, if, they could be, you know, look, if you told me they had the best regular season record in the East, I wouldn't bat an eye. They did two years ago. That was with Ben Simmons. Like I think this is the best roster that Embiid has played with since the 2018, 19, like when they traded for Jimmy Butler, the, the wild card in all of this, is of course just the Nets because I just yeah, refuse right. to put them in tier one of anything. Because <laughs> right. I don't know Zach Lowe calling them the Brooklyn on papers on his podcast, which is absolutely perfect. So I don't know enough about them, but they're a wild card that could impact a lot of people in the East. But I have the Sixers. I'm just I'm fine. The, the Nets are so combustible. I trust the Sixers more. Do you have yeah. any final thoughts on this team that I didn't ask you about? Something you think we really need to to cover? Any strong Jaden Springer or <laughs> Isaiah Joe takes that you need to get off? Uh, Isaiah Joe's a sore spot because he is fully non-guaranteed until opening night. And as I mentioned, they uh, they are one over the regular season limit right now. So whether it's via trade or they just need to waive someone, it, oh, it's probably him, Trevor and Queen, who they signed this off season. Uh, but they gave him three hundred thousand guaranteed, and you know, knowing they did that, knowing they were hard capped, which I found interesting because mm -hmm. i don't think you you know they're they're low enough under they're like more than three million in breathing room right now because harden took so much less so even if they had to swallow that three hundred thousand, like not a huge deal but to me that at least signals that he's more likely to make the team than perhaps some of these other guys so i'm curious to see what happens like how who they do end up waving if they don't make a trade um and yeah, I mean, Tobias, I think, is going to be the other big wild card for this team. Because if if we see the version that showed up like mid-March on and through the playoffs, then I do have more confidence in them as a legitimate title threat. Um, but if we see the ver version with Harden and, you know, has, no one's going to call him an elite defender. But at least he tried in the playoffs. Like if he goes back to, uh, you know, not not being as competent on that end of the floor, that's going to be a big problem for this team. So I'm just excited to see how the season plays out. Uh, I will keep my fingers crossed that everyone stays healthy and that, you know, I don't have, I forget when the two Nuggets games are, like January and March, I think. I don't have those two days ruined by... My Twitter mentions just being an absolute catastrophe. But um, yeah, I, I think it's going to be a hopefully fun season. Or if not, Doc Rivers is going to get fired by the end of the year. If not before. Uh, yeah. Brian, 
This was great as always. Uh, thank you for allowing me to work through the rust because I haven't done these look aheads in forever. So you're also the guinea pig. You were the inaugural 22, 23 look ahead, not preview, not primer look aheads. Those are, those are just spicier and more salient and just more, <laughs> more profound than primers and previews. Are you able to tell our listeners where they can find you and all the fantastic work that you do? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at B T O P O R E K. You can find my Sixers stuff uh, at Liberty Ballers of SB Nation. And then I also do Sixers stuff and salary cap stuff at Forbes. I'm going to like really nerd out this month before the season starts. Like I, I just posted something today about, uh, you know, class draft class of 2019. Now that Mitchell and KD are off the market, I think they might. We might might see some extensions for Tyler Hero, DeAndre Hunter types going into the 2020 draft class next, like how the new CBA affects their extensions. So if you if you are one of the six people in the world that finds that stuff interesting, please follow me there. Thank you so much once again. And as you know, I'll be pestering you again in the short in the short future. Please please do anytime. But in the meantime, enjoy your well-earned vacation and uh yeah, well, we're going to have to have you on as well because we've got our, our league pass rankings coming up uh, that we, we love having you and uh, Adam on for. And I do love those, but I also find myself angry at you and Mort for forcing me to go through that exercise because it's so <laughs> challenging. It's like very accomplished when you're doing it, but you also hate everything you're saying and doing as you're doing it. It's going to be even more impossible this year because like, other than Utah and San Antonio, there is not a single team that I'm not genuinely excited to watch. Yeah. I'm like, I'm even excited. I'm in love with Josh Primo. So like, and Jeremy. So, and, and, uh, yeah. even Evan Vassell. So I'm like in love with the Spurs too. I'm with you. Uh, but thank you so much. I'll talk to you soon. And like always around these parts, we leave everyone with a shout out to the one, the only, the indelible Frank Nielakina. 